good evening everyone it's my honor to welcome you all to the first ever cloud fest of netaji subhash engineering college cloud is one of the key aspects of the it industry and companies are investing huge in it it is expanding every day which indicates that it has got a great scope in the coming years but sadly not many freshers are aware of this current cutting edge technology which makes them fail when it comes to satisfying the present it sector's business requirement keeping this point in mind gnx the official linux user group of netaji subhash engineering college and phoenix the official tech club of netaji subhash engineering college came up with the idea of cloud fest 2020 it is an initiative which takes into consideration the idea or the concept of cloud computing which is a cutting edge technology its main motive is to make the college students aware of the current technology which makes it easier for them to find jobs and placements in the coming year now i like to call upon our first speaker mr shantan sen gupta who would be covering microsoft azure today he is an azure certified data engineer and azure certified solutions architect expert along with it sir has 15 plus years of industry experience and i believe it will be an eye opener for all the freshers out here now i would like to invite sir sir kindly come hello all good, good evening, evening sir good evening thank good you for joining evening. in now i would like to pass on the event to sir over to you sir hi all uh, uh in this pandemic days right we cannot see each other it's uh, very difficult to uh, as a speaker to convey my messages to each and every one of you uh, but i would like to uh, cover up a uh, few things on azures and uh, also before starting anything i would like to thank uh, netaji shubhas institute of technology the faculty member the principal team for nix and uh, team gnx uh, for organizing this i have uh, seen that uh, uh, often there are some uh, gaps between the academics and the industries what uh, happening in the industries and what we learn from academy there is a uh, big gap that to be used to face while uh, entering into the industry so uh, i am very happy that you people have organized this so that uh, prior to stepping in into the industry you will have some messages uh, you can prepare your thought processes <clears throat> uh, with uh, which it will definitely help in your first step into the industry right so uh then in uh, shall i proceed uh, with my deck or there is something yes sir you can proceed us? sir okay thank you uh, so uh, let me share my screen so uh, my name is shantan uh, i am having around 15 plus years of experience uh, in industry where i earned 6 plus years in uh, azure uh, technologies so i'm bit uh, uh, since i passed uh, my btech and then started my career in oracle uh, database uh, then i uh, went through multiple technologies uh, and i Uh, try to find out the challenges and the new things to learn. So starting with Oracle, then SQL Server, then uh, Microsoft BI, and uh, then Hadoop. In the uh, stepped into the big data world, then Hadoop and Spark, and then moved into Azure technologies. So this is my brief career. Also in between, uh, I thought of doing my MBA. So uh, I completed it from I am Calcutta, and then I. Came back to the technical line again uh, because it's my uh, 
area of interest rather. So it's a brief about myself. Now I would like to uh, like this session to be very interactive. I'm not a very uh, slide oriented person that to go through the slide. Usually I voice over uh, whatever I think to explain. So uh, I'm not sure uh, in this application how we can uh, do it. Uh, one minute, uh, let me check. I think this comment section we can use, right, uh, Navneen? Students to drop their comments and then we can interact okay. with them as well. Yeah, okay. So uh, I can see you, but you can, uh, I would uh, like to hear back from you. So uh, please keep on commenting. Uh, right, so let me start with, uh, The next slide okay so i'm not sure how it is visible to you that's a big problem so should be fine right uh it, the slide is visible to you right yes sir the slide is visible okay so uh, let me ask you a question before starting to the slide right why we have conducted a series of uh, uh, tech talk rather it's a sort of a technical discussions right so it, it could be a tech talk um, why we have uh, conducted or you people have conducted this kind of uh, a series of uh, discussion on cloud technologies what is the thought behind it i would just like to know from you people is it because that uh, every second people technical people are talking about is it because that uh, often you are uh, getting offers on these technologies in terms of jobs or what is the thought behind it anyone at least the organizers who have organized this. So cloud is something that is used now in everyday life. Initially, it used to be a platform where we could store the data and that was it. But right now it's expand is more beyond that. Right now, cloud is not just limited to storing data. It is used for accessing manipulation and also for AI and ML. So its scope has increased over the years. And pandemic has actually shown us what is the power of cloud computing. Agree. Uh, but there are certain other technologies, right? Suppose you are uh, uh, working on different technologies which was implemented uh, within, uh, within on-premise server, right? Uh, still, uh, during the pandemic, you can access those servers, right? Maybe through VPN or whatever. So, uh, what, why exactly cloud? There are lots of, uh, still lots of popular technologies that uh, customers are using, big companies are using. There are lots of job opportunities as well there. So, I right, think the first. Sorry. I understand earlier that uh, to learn about cloud computing, but why? There are lots so of the things first, to learn, right? The first thing is cloud is all based on pay as you go service. If we have a server initially in the olden days, it used to be one server, one user, one application, one database. But that was not completely using the resources that was available on the server. Hence, the concept of cloud computing came in where we used to chop that bigger server into smaller chunks. And now this single chunk can now store its own database, its own application, its own OS regarding the fact that it is using the same bare metal. Earlier, that one bare metal used to have only one hardware, one application, one database. But right now, that same bare metal can contain multiple applications as well. Right. I agree. I agree with Hirsch as well. It provides high availability. So let's go back uh, to our topic. Rather, I'm not starting with the topic. So seeing the screen, right? What what you are getting from here? Any idea what uh, what it is about? This is an advertisement of. 
it's an advertisement of the Kodak camera where it says you press the button, we do the rest. So the processing part is already done by the Kodak camera. The Kodak company is actually working for the processing part. We just have to give what we need and the rest done is done by the Kodak camera. Right, so, but still after doing this, where is Kodak nowadays? Expenses. What I can think is expensive. Okay. It was expensive. But uh, I don't know how many people have joined uh, if you are having the account. Anyone using this brand uh, right now or anyone is having any anything uh, related to this brand? Are you using anything uh, which is manufactured by Kodak nowadays? Yes, no. So people are saying that Kodak has been obsolete in the present market because of its expense and still it is using the basic concepts and the basic technologies which have been uh, outshone by the other users. That's what I can see from the comment section. Right. So once Kodak was um, uh, having a maximum market share in in this uh, film industry right they were into the selling film business but what they have missed is the rise of digital transformation right so uh, once we have the digital cameras did you see kodak anywhere at that point of time no right no sir uh, no of course no. not right that means they have missed that rise of the digital transformation did they really Indeed. miss the rise of the digital transformation some service said no why it's because at 1975 one of their engineer itself built a prototype of a digital camera okay and they were the first to invent it but still they don't have any market on the digital camera side. Why? Because their main business area was the film. And once digital camera was there, then they need to compromise on, on this segment of their market of selling the films, right? And the man or the uh, engineer who invented that was uh, Steve Sasson. But the management was not interested on in the digital camera right at that point of time they didn't realize that uh, digital technologies was rising they might get some threat in future only in this uh, film uh, making the films and uh, selling the films right and they haven't invested on that invention rather and slowly at uh, at the uh, year 2012, they uh, declared bankruptcy, right? So exactly, Harsha, I'm coming to that. Very good. So uh, what we have learned from here, what we have learned? Changes is inevitable, right? We need to think about the changes, what is happening, the changes that are happening surrounding us. And whether to step into those changes or not, that is a very vital decisions that we need to take, right? Agree? So let's see, Harsh, on my next slide, okay? Can anyone tell me uh, what it is about? Or what is this related to? I'm not able to see my screen, so you can go back. You can see my screen, right? 
Yes, sir. The screen is visible. Yeah, sure. It. It's Nokia. Exactly. It's Nokia CEO statement. What happened to Nokia again? There was the market leader at 1998, right? And uh, there was the best. They, they were having the best selling, uh, uh, recognized as a best selling brand at that point of time. And gradually they failed in market. What could be the reason of the this? Sir, they 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 didn't shift from the basic to the Android. They didn't shift, and that was the main reason why Samsung came into picture. They didn't expect that. They were not ready for changing their ideologies of working. They were still focusing on that smaller basic phones, which were not good enough at that point of time, which gave birth to Samsung, which started ruling the market after that point. Right. So they were having very good hardware, as right, and they were so confident that with the hardware itself they can capture the market. But they were not changing with the uh, consumer requirement, right? Because consumer requirement was changing. Though they were having best hardware in the market, but they were not changing in terms of other aspects with the features, with the adoptions of uh, uh, smartphones and those things, right? And slowly they started losing markets to Apple and Samsung, but they tried to come back, right? They have, they got a second chance. What they did at that point of time when they introduced the smart uh, phone. What were the OS they were using when they came back with the smartphone? They came to Android from uh, from Symbian to Android. They were initially using Symbian OS and then they shifted to Android in the second chance that right. they were given. The first one, first one was Symbian OS, right? Which was again the outdated one. Someone mentioned, Soham mentioned it, right? So again, on the second chance, chance they collaborated with Microsoft and they again uh, launched the Windows Mobile, right? They use the Windows Mobile again. The consumers uh, does not accept, accept it, and they lost the second chance as well. So there are clearly lack of visions of the management. Uh, they which caused this, as well as they don't want to change from whatever was happening. Uh, to their organization or the mode of uh, business that they were doing and slowly they have they uh, they go goes out of market and uh, they get called out bankruptcy and uh, uh, it's a fall of uh, Nokia there itself in 2012 or some somewhere between that time right so these are the two stories that I have selected why I selected this story, there is nothing to do with this uh, agenda that we are going through, right? There is no relation with Azure. Why I've picked up these two stories are, these are very two common stories of failure. And from this kind of stories only, we will come to know that, ch again, change is inevitable. We need to select the right path to move ahead. We need to concentrate on uh, the changes and uh, need to understand why these changes are required. That's why I asked at very beginning, right? That why you have conducted a session on cloud? Why not on other technologies? That is very important before before you are uh, taking a decision about doing anything. You need to know that why you sh should head or where you are heading towards uh, what should be your goal and what target you are trying to achieve with taking that decision that is very important right there is another one uh, that I would like to show you before jumping into our original topics 
Any idea about this beautiful picture? Anyone seen this before? Or what what you are seeing in this picture? Any guess? Uh, so I believe it was a big river which has now turned into like which has shortened its path or where which has lost its pathway that it used to be followed years ago. This river is called as River Koluteka. This is in Honduras. Anyone knows about Honduras environment? So Honduras used to uh, get uh, multiple natural disasters because of its location and uh, uh, they, uh, they, right. So this river name is uh, River Poluteca. So uh, Honduras uh, faces multiple natural disaster. Disaster. Uh, they uh, gone through multiple hurricanes and those things, right? And uh, every year, quite a few thousands of people uh, used to die over there because of this natural disaster. So, and. Uh, uh, Due to uh, this kind of disaster, their roads get swept away, uh, and uh, their uh, government is to uh, face lots of uh, uh, issues uh, due to this kind of uh, disaster that happens uh, quite often in Honduras, right? So uh, there was a river called uh, River Coluteca over there. So th what they decided, so. Uh, that uh, th there was no bridge uh, to go from this side to another side. So th they decided to create a bridge on top of that river. But because of this hurricane and this kind of environment, uh, they need a solid bridge over there, which will restrict uh, this kind of natural disaster or withstand this kind of natural disasters, right? So this is uh, what uh, they thought about. And uh, they have given uh, a contract, this contract to a company of uh, which is uh, located at Japan. And uh, when they are also specialized of making this kind of uh, bridges over um, bridges, which can withstand of any kind of natural disasters. And uh, on 1996, uh, they have decided to uh, developed this bridge and uh, the development was on uh, the construction was completed on nine, early 1998 february march and they happily opened it for the uh, public to use it to uh, cross the river from here and there right now um, uh, on uh, the same year uh, around after six months right uh, again a um, hurricane uh, came in which uh, was massive it poured around uh, 75 inches of rain in four days, which is uh, actually six months to one year's rain in Honduras, overall rain. So 75 inches of uh, rain that uh, uh, happened uh, at that point of time. And due to that natural disaster, it swept away the roads of either side of the bridge. Okay, so you can see in this picture, right? It's only the bridge that is standing because that is that was their motto, right? That bridge should not uh, swept away or there should not be any uh, effect on the bridge because of any kind of natural disaster. So they, whatever they thought of, that uh, basically uh, they have implemented, but they never thought of uh, happening this, that the roads will swept away uh, because of this kind of uh, disaster, right? And you can see that the bridge is standing alone and there is no uh, road to get into the bridge or to get, uh, get out of, from the bridge, right? Not only this, what happened due to that natural disaster is the river uh, Koluteka changed its path 
which which was ideally going up through under the bridge and uh, now it started going uh, by bifurcating the bridge on the other side right so there is uh, means after 6 months whatever they thought of doing it there is no point or no values uh, were there what means whatever they thought of right uh, like uh, uh, that bridge will withstand all those uh, got uh, oh, they means uh, those got met but they never thought of the surrounding problems that could arise right and the baseline of the story is there is no point of creating that kind of bridge even if they they didn't thought uh, so never think about that what else could happen they have wasted their money time and effort everything over there so what the les lessons we learn from here is always think twice or multiple times before you want to become an expert in certain areas which can be redundant after a few months or few years right so you will invest your effort you will invest your time but at end, maybe that suppose you are a, all a techie, right? So you, you you will become a technical expert in uh, certain after certain years. But at that point of time, you ne also need to concentrate on whether those technologies are changing because of multiple demands, right? And then only invest your time and effort on those technologies so that you will get the award out of it. It won't happen like this again. Right. So, uh, any question on this, or am I clear uh, what I tried to explain you? Yes, Shavik. River changed its path. Hope I am clear. So good. So that's the message I would like to uh, give you uh, in my first three slide. Okay. So these are the. It, it, you can say it's a uh, it's a negative uh, negative uh, slides where uh, I'm showing you multiple failures, but we will always learn from the failures only, right? And uh, as much as we could learn from the failures, we um, we will be su succeed in our next step. So that's uh, why I have uh, given you these three kinds of examples. Now coming to the cloud technologies, right? So why we uh, we have started with the clouds? Why do we require clouds? Some of you have already explained that uh, maybe for the availability, it's true. Uh, what else, why do we need cloud or why the clients are moving into the cloud nowadays? What are the reasons that uh, uh, customers are nowadays moving into the cloud? Better resource utilization, good. What else? So what is cloud? Cheap pay as you go service, okay? It's not only always cheap pay, Navneet, but uh, we'll come to that. Remote access, remote access, even you can uh, remotely access your on-prem uh, VMs, right? Flexible, flexible in terms of?
So what is cloud? Why it is called cloud or what is cloud? Future ready. Right, user does not need to actively manage it. Good. But why are those servers hosted? Mobility of the system. Why are the server hosted? Cloud servers, data centers. And why are those data centers? Efficient usage of hardware, yeah, we have discussed it. Why are those data centers hosted? Right, in the region specified by the cloud providers. So, think about it. Suppose in Netaji Shubash, right, they might have their own servers in it, an on-premise server that might be residing in one of your building or office spaces, right? Yeah, different geographical locations, right? So uh, suppose you are you people are having a server, and that hosted maybe uh, some of your on-premise room or Netaji Shubha's building's room somewhere, right? And uh, there will be there will be someone who will maintain those servers and provide you uh, will give you the access, right? That that's what I'm doing, Aditya. So. They will give you the access, they will maintain the server. There, there will be periodic maintenance of those servers, right? They need to switch up those servers. Maybe they will run some applications or the updates onto the server. At that point of time, as a user, you people cannot use those servers, right? And also, uh, that server is having a very limited size. And you you probably suppose uh, 50 or 100 of of the Netishuva students are currently accessing those servers. Now, maybe uh, because uh, the number of people grows, they uh, maybe 200 or 500 people are going to access those servers and that server does not fit into because it can only give access to those 200 servers or the uh, storage capacity that they were having. It's not sufficient to distribute among 500 students of the, this uh, college, right? So what they need to do, they need to go and buy out another server, they need to fit into their server room and uh, need to connect with the old server so that they can accommodate the uh, greater needs to access of those servers. Now, these all things you can get rid of once you move to the cloud. How? Now, if I talk, uh, I'm talking from a, Azure perspective, as Navneet said, that the servers are hosted on the data center of the, each vendor. Here, who is the vendor? Microsoft is the vendor of the Azure, right? So Microsoft hosted multiple thousands of servers in their data centers. And those servers are used in sharing basis. Now think about it. Now Netaji Shubhash is accessing a cloud server. They have moved from on-premise system to cloud now. So now initially they have selected only the storage that they required for 100 students. Only the, uh, maybe uh, the applications, whatever the uh, applications you people use, right? They've installed on those servers, maybe uh, as part of, part of a virtual machine. And uh, once the requirement grows from 100 to 500, what they can do with click of some button, they can extend the storage limit.
cap capable of uh, doing it uh, or handle uh, 500 users uh, concurrently, right? So that applications can be still reused. They can easily you uh, increase the storages over there of click of a, click of a button. Now, this is in terms of giving access of all 500 students to that particular server. So this is in terms of increasing the storage limits. Now also think of the perspective that suppose for first two years, they only required on to give access and use the storages for 100 users or 100 students. They, they, they have saved the cost of extra storages what 500 student needs. Namnita, am I still audible? Yes, you are audible, yes. sir. Okay. So, uh, what we have, we talked about is from the cost savings, the implementation uh, efforts, right? Because suppose you need to procure a server, extra server, when you are having it in on-premise. It has to go through different processes. It uh, you need to uh, go and procure another server. You need to install it. You need to uh, implement the networking, and then only you can um, probably ready to use it. But here, within few minutes, with click of click of a button, you can extend your storages or other uh, applications that you are going to use uh, based on your usage, right? So you are saving your cost, you are saving your time, and as well as easily you can extend or scale your applications, right? This all benefits are coming together when you are moving to cloud. It's not necessary that it will always save your cost once, once you move into your cloud. It's not necessary because whatever you are using, you need to optimal optimal way so that there will be a cost saving factors as well. Suppose you're using your mobile audio. But you are running that, that car unnecessary more number of kilometer than uh, uh, fuel efficient car. At that point of time, if you compare, you won't get that cost benefit out of it because there is there are unnecessary usage, right? So definitely to thumb rule that it will always save your cost, but there is always a chance to use it optimally so that you can save lots of cost over there. So that's an important aspect of it, right? Now, there are multiple cloud options. How many types of clouds do uh, you know? I'm not talking about vendor like uh, Azure or AWS or Google, but uh, types of clouds I'm talking about. Public private hybrid. Very good. Public private hybrid. So, what is private cloud? Azure is a public cloud or a private cloud? There is no organization.
Translation. Azure is a public cloud. Yes, true. Right. So that's about the pub, uh, public cloud or private cloud rather. So any example that which kind of industry uses private cloud and why? Yeah, which kind of companies? Why they want to store it in uh, on their own premise uh, rather than in public cloud? No. Accessible to certain person, uh, even you can uh, implement it, those security features in public cloud as well. So mostly the financial in industry, finance industry, right? Maybe the banking industry or the insurance industry do follow uh, or prefer private cloud over public cloud because they are having so much of restrictions. Uh, also, those restrictions are uh, imposed by their government, individual government as well, because they usually have so much of uh, uh, secu uh, secured information, PII data, which their uh, government does not allow you to put into the pu public cloud. Okay, and even they are going to put it; uh, those data have to be put into the public cloud. That has to be masked and uh, uh, secured uh, in uh, such a way uh, so that th that will fall under their government policies, right? So uh, when I use the terminology PII, what, what is the full form of PII? Anyone? PII? PII data is the personal information data, which usually we cannot put into the public cloud without data masking. Okay, so that's that's the reason that uh, this kind of industries like finance, uh, financial industries like banking out uh, who are into the uh, who are into the uh, right pers personal identifiable information, right? So uh, who are into the insurance or who, who the industry into the banking, they preferred uh, private cloud because uh, you, you might have heard about GDPR, right? Uh, which uh, they have imposed on for UK as well. So for G GDPR, it's uh, uh, norms that you need to follow while implementing any such solutions. And if that pub uh, particular public cloud uh, Support that, then you can go with the public cloud. Otherwise, you 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 probably needs to be in the private uh, cloud or private server itself, right? So, and those no, uh, company needs to obey those rules and those norms, and uh, based on that, they decides whether to th they need to go with the private or a public cloud. Okay, so that's on the private cloud. So we'll keep it aside. Now coming to the other two cloud that is an hybrid. And, and another is the public cloud. So what is hybrid? Hybrid is that part of your data is already in your cloud or part of your applications you're using cloud of your entire uh, architecture or entire solution. And maybe your part of your data still resides into your uh, uh, private uh, server, right? Because uh, you won't, uh, you cannot put that particular data into the into the public cloud, but the rest of, of the operations you can still perform into the public cloud, right? So that gives you the hybrid uh, cloud uh, solutioning where you probably have some of your data at on-premise, some of your data into the cloud, and, uh, as well as the applications. 
Now coming to the public cloud. Right. So coming to the public cloud that your entire applications, entire data is in public cloud. Though so it's in very um, uh, kept in a very secured manner. Uh, oh, oh God. It means after implementing all the security policies and those things so that your data cannot be hacked or cannot be accessed by uh, someone else apart from you uh, as long as you are implementing all the security policies or the security features properly, right? Right, disaster recovery use cases. Uh, See, in hybrid cloud, right, whatever is there in the cloud, whatever part is there in the cloud, that will still can cover with the disaster recovery, right? So uh, you, suppose your data is in one region uh, in terms of Azure I'm talking about. And if you have uh, uh, going with the ZRS, that is zone redundancy or uh, redundant storage or uh, with your regional uh, re uh, redundant storage will be your second set of uh, same data will be replicated over there in case of disaster recovery within few seconds you can recover your data and you can use it for your applications right so definitely that uh, in, in hybrid cloud the that public cloud part will be covered on the private cloud definitely you need to go with the different servers uh, to implement the disaster recovery, there there is a separate mechanism, but that is not uh, similar to the public cloud disaster recovery implementations. Okay. Financial and insurance also can put some data to premise and remaining in public cloud. Yes, definitely they can. They can. They are doing it actually uh, to use the advantages of the public cloud. Okay. In many cases, they are doing it. So uh, this is what the different clouds are. Now let's uh, go back to Azure. So I hope it's clear. So it's uh, this data uh, on this slide, right? Uh, this data is a bit old, uh, but still it, it, it can give you a sense of that uh, how much uh, cloud interactions are uh, predicted. Like uh, now nowadays people are not thinking that whether they will move to cloud or not, right? We are uh, we every company who are working on this digital uh, transformation part in day day in day out they are give, getting lots of uh, opportunities on uh, data modernization. What is data modernization? It's called as your data is in it, maybe in your private storages, and now I need to move my data to public cloud or in, into the cloud to get all the ad, uh, or uh, to get all the advantages of the uh, cloud itself right so that that's called as in data modernization so that is what they request on um, many requ uh, lots of requests are coming in that how i can move my data now right to get the proper insight of the data even though they are having terabytes of data in their on premise systems but they are not getting proper insights. I'm not sure whether you are getting the terminology insights, what I'm talking about. But uh, whenever I'm talking about to extract some meaningful insights, that means that uh, you need to understand your data and you need to get some informations out of it, right? So uh, suppose you are having lots of customer data and uh, what they would like to buy, but uh, how you will use it and how that data will give you advantage that is what you need to take out of that particular data right suppose um suppose a company suppose nike right nike is having lots of data with them uh, stored in their on premise system i'm not i mean nike is in cloud already i know but uh, i'm just given an example don't quote me uh but they would like to understand demographic wise when i'm talking about demographic demographic means uh, excuse, me, sir. excuse me sir excuse me sir yeah. i i yeah. like to interrupt for your moment our principal sir is here oh sorry. okay sorry 
extremely sorry i was uh, busy for some pre schedule work sorry please no continue please continue please continue uh, okay sir thank you thank you so uh sorry nagdeep where i was okay uh I, I was talking about data modernization, right? So uh, suppose uh, I was giving an example of Nike. Don't quote me again because Nike is already in, into cloud. But suppose they are having lots of demographic data and their choice of uh, wearing the shoes, right? What kind of shoes they would like to uh, li li like to wear? Like uh, suppose uh, at the age of uh, a sixty and above, people are uh, like to wear very comfortable shoes, whereas the teens would like to wear the uh, shoes which looks good uh, from outside and will fit them, uh, will uh, help them to look smart and those kind of things, right? So they have those data, but they cannot get insight out of it, informations out of it, that this demographic, for this demographic, I need to build this kind of shoes. For this demographic, I need to build this kind of shoes, right? That information they can only get out of those data once they choose the right technologies like machine learning, like artificial intelligence. So, and all those technologies are clubbed into within cloud itself, right? So nowadays, all the companies are trying to move into the cloud, not only because of the storage, as Navneet said at the very beginning uh, by answering one of my question, not only for storage, not only for availability, also to use the technologies available within that particular cloud. Okay, there are lots of technologies. I am having a uh, holistic view of the technologies of what Azure is having, though. Well, a few technologies could be missing out of it. It's not a very recent slide that uh, I have put together here because I don't have that copy with me. But uh, this is what is available over internet. Also, you can look at it. There's a lots of technologies that are available over here, right? So it's not a choice now whether we will stay back into the uh, on-premise server or we will move uh, to the cloud. Now, the situation is how they can move to the cloud, right? Sorry. So, this is what we have discussed so far. I, as I said, right, I am not very slide oriented person, so I don't go by the slide or the orientation of my slides. But this is what we have decide, uh, discussed already. What is on-premises? We have discussed. So you need to bring your own machines, your own softwares. You need to manage it by yourself itself. And there will be lots of downtimes, lots of cost. In, uh, in, in, it will also incur lots of cost. Whereas when you are going with the hoster, hoster is something like you can still go into a cloud like uh, suppose um, nowadays everybody are using android or apple mobile right iphone so they pro used to provide you the cloud storage right but how much they are giving you in uh, free suppose uh, the google drive right it's only 20 gb is free and post that they're giving you the package that maybe you can uh, uh, use up to 150 gb but you need you you will cost this much right you need to pay this much for a, a, a 150 gb though you are not using 150 gb you probably using 30 gb or 40 gb but you are still paying for that 150 gb right similarly uh, apple uh, or iphone is also giving those kind of ranges that you can select and uh, keep on storing your data uh, out of your mobile but you are still paying on for the upper limit of those storages right so the those does not make any sense in case of uh, enterprise level uh, implementation, right? So what is what is uh, the option left? That is the cloud where you can share, you, 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 it will give you the multi-net tenant environment. Uh, it will offer you the pool of computing of the resources. And uh, it's, uh, you people already know that uh, you can opt for a pay as you go uh, options for it. 
I'm not looking at the screen, Navneet. Just uh, let me know if anyone is having any questions. You can keep on posting. Okay. Yes, I'll let Thank you me. know by seeing the comment section if any question right. arises. Right. Thank you. So let's see uh, what cloud computing is. So at the left, left, left hand side um, uh, picture, right, you can see the on premise system looks like a iceberg, whereas the tip of the iceberg is on top of the ocean and the bottom level is huge. What all are um, included over there, the customization and implementation, hardware, IT professionals, maintenance, trainings, your cost, your uh, uh, server procurement, everything was under, under the sea, right? Which you cannot see in, uh, but that is there when you are going to implement this all will cost you, right? In terms of cloud computing, probably your subscription fee will be higher, but on the under undersea part, it will be very less because most of the things will be maintained by the cloud vendors, right? Like Azure, like AWS for Amazon or Google. So it's only the implementation, customization and training costs that it will incur, right? And, the, uh, and for that, what uh, apart from that, once your implementation is over, then only the subscription fee, maybe you need to provide training. Nowadays, it's not relevant. Many people know these technologies, at least some of the technologies within the entire cloud environment and the configurations, right? So the five tenants that we were talking about so far, you all know this about these slides now. That's why I was not opening this and I was discussing only with the with the, uh, I, I was only voice overing those. So we have a uh, yeah. So we have a question. Can you please repeat the basic difference between private and public cloud in case of real life application purposes? In case of real life application. Real life application, as I said, right? Uh, like uh, the financial institutes, like uh, banking institutes, the uh, insurance institute, those are having very many secured, uh, secure data, like transaction data, like PII data. And because of uh, government uh, norms, right, to follow the, the government norms, they cannot put it into the public cloud, right, because it's, it's getting used in sharing basis. And uh, public cloud is having some of the more security features than the public cloud, not every time, but in certain cases, yes, it's having some of the uh, extra security features because it's surrounded within your premise or you are the only person that you are going to use that particular server of or, 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 or those uh, private clouds, right? So uh, on those aspects, even now, still till date, we're having, I, I have seen very few banking com customers comparing how many banking customers are there across globe. There are very few banking customers who are migrating their applications to public cloud. Rather, they're preferring to uh, be into the uh, private cloud because to follow those norms and those things. Wherever, however, if they are having some applications which are not really dealing with those kind of data, they are, they are moving into the public cloud, okay? Because they don't restrict, want to restrict themselves to be there into the private cloud because it's having lots of disadvantages as well because you need to maintain those uh, servers. You, you are owning those servers basically. So you the cost of implementation will be higher in terms of private cloud instead of public cloud because Public clouds, you are sharing uh, the servers, all the storages, everything, whereas private clouds, you are owning it. So on that aspect, but why they are moving from uh, personal servers to the private cloud? Because the availability, right? Because these vendors are giving you the availability up to 99.69 percentage. Uh, and that is very important for your business purpose, right? So that's why they are moving to the private cloud and some of the applications which are not dealing with those kind of data, 
the, those are uh, they are uh, going to the public uh, or uh, migrating to the pu public cloud is that answer your question uh, i guess he is satisfied with the answers we can proceed ahead sir okay so the five tenants that we were talking about right that is on demand self service how there are lots of technologies that are hosted within i'm talking about public cloud perspective again or cloud computing perspective again are hosted over there where with just click of few buttons you can install those or you can start using those once it is provisioned into the cloud those um, applications are provisioned into the cloud you can start using it right so and it, suppose today you want that application to be installed you want to do something maybe down the line after 6 months you don't need you can uh, delete uh, those application from your uh, subscription which will not cost you anything for the, the beyond those 6 months so it's uh, definitely an on demand things whenever you want you can install or use it whenever or provision it whenever you don't want you can uh, get rid of it or you can delete it right pay for what you use or the major service that's that's why i have given that example of the storage is right suppose today i am storing a 5 terabytes of data i will only pay for that particular storage i need not to give an upper limit of the storage and i need uh, means i need not to keep on paying for that upper limit of the storage tomorrow if i am getting another 5 tb of data i will keep on storing over there from tomorrow onwards i will start paying for the 10 tb not the 5 tb but still today i will pay only for 5 tb not for the 10 tb right the multi tenant resource pooling it's again you you will have multiple resources over there you can implement the multi tenancy you can use it so it will give you the best availability and the performance rapid elasticity suppose we have the features i am not sure how many you have gone through the uh, any computation uh, services uh, or you have any one of you let me go back uh, to the screen okay if any any one of you uh, uh ever get into the uh, uh, uh what, what's that azure.microsoft.com uh, that portal portal.microsoft azure.com that uh, link or get into that okay once you are there right any one of you provisioned any of the big data solutions like uh, sd insight or databricks or some other computation services any of the computation services that you have used if no let me tell you suppose whenever we provision the big data you have prov okay you you have some experience on cosmos db good navneet so in case of cosmos db right what do you said are you you said right resource unit you said are you which usually starts from 100 are you right 100 to 200 400000 right what is this are you are you is nothing but the computation plus your storage uh computation plus your uh, means they calculates is with uh, computation and your storage and uh, they ask you to select your are you which will give you the computation power in it but in case you required higher are you specifically while during when you will be writing into the cosmos db which can be wong mongo db which can be sql api uh, which can be cassandra api once you start writing in it the writing cost will be more than the reading cost right and probably for terabytes of data you need to scale up your rus so that you can ingest the data more in faster manner right now that is what the scaling is either with click of in cosmos db you need to manually scale it up at that point of time with few click of a button but in certain cases like azure databricks uh hd insight interactive cluster there you can mention what will be your lower limit and the upper limit of scaling 
suppose you are talking about 10 cluster right cluster node the lower limit is 2 cluster node and the upper limit is 10 cluster node and depends upon your workload it will automatically increase and decrease and that is how you can scale up at the same time you can save the cost right and that is very important and that cannot happen within an on-premise server because on-premise server you are already already hosted and you set the upper limit there is even even it is not getting utilized to that limit you will cost for that upper limit only right so that is what is rapid elasticity hyperscale and broad network access it's a very common one right any questions here this is scalability elasticity is something like it it will horizontally horizontally means what will happen like uh, sql db right we we are having that elasticity so that means it it will horizontally scale up okay and horizontally scale down that's that's what the elasticity is that that elasticity part comes with the uh, storage part whereas for computation, the scalability comes in. Definitely, you got my point. For computation, you always need a scalable solution. Suppose, so, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that uh, it's all about dynamic uh, motion. You said that dynamically it is being done, but uh, elasticity dynamic. is somewhat like dynamic scalability, I believe. See, there, there are two parts, okay? Whenever we are talking about scalability in terms of computation, it does not uh, relate it to storage part, right? So elastically scale, if you are talking about elastically scale, then it's coming to the computation part. If you are talking about only elasticity, that means your storage can increase uh, in, whenever you need your storage will increase and use the elasticity of the storages. So there are two parts, elast elastically scalable and the elastic storage, which you can find in, in your Azure SQL DB. So when I'm talking about storage, that means suppose you are storing five uh, terabytes of data today and tomorrow you need to store another five terabyte along with the five terabyte, which becomes 10 terabyte, it will all automatically, elastically, the, your storage storage will get increased. Okay. So, so now, the concepts of dynamic and horizontal scaling, the concept of horizontal and dynamic scaling, is it only right. limited to storage part? Is it only limited to the storage no, part? No, that is the concept to the computation part. Okay, I get it. I get it, sir. Right, because what will happen? I will give you a uh, very uh, simple example. Suppose you, uh, you have all past three, four years back, uh, either your HS or your 10 plus 2 exams, right? And how you have seen your exams, exam uh, report, or the mark sheet through online uh, link, right? Yes, no. Yes, so we used to use the online portal for getting the mark sheet downloaded. Right. Frequently, uh, we can hear in the news that it goes down because of uh, many people have started accessing it, right? That means it increased the concurrency. Many people at the same time started accessing the same link or the same application and it goes beyond its concurrency limit, right? So that is what your concurrency. Now, when you started retrieving the data from your database, what your database should give you the compute power to retrieve that many of uh, uh, or respond to that, uh, that many of requests, right? So that is your computation. And where is your data stored? in the storage that you are retrieving using your computation power or during uh, using the computation for power your uh, results are getting calculated automatically your percentages are getting calculated that is what is the transformations 
are happening on the fly. Got it? Yes, sir. I got the point. I got the point, sir. So, think Azure as an innovation enabler perspective. So, I would like to change your mindset of what I have talked about is how these transformations are happening, why these transformation and transformations are happening, or what is the requirement of this transformation? What is the transformation? We need to move probably we need to move to the cloud to get advantages of it and to be in the market and to be in the competition, right? From client perspective, from a developer perspective, or a, another comp uh, um, data modernization company perspective, right? So that is very important that it's we are not learning or we are not working on any cloud services only because of every third, third person are talking about it, not only because of there are jobs on it, that is only because of it is a sustainable method to proceed forward. Now, so far, I have not talked about any languages for coding. Am I? No. Right? I haven't talked about either on C Sharp, either on Java, or any either on Python, any other languages so far. I, why? I will tell you. So th this is what we have talked about already. So you all know that its availability is huge. They uh, usually this vendor's claims are on 99.69 percentage of avail availability. Uh, it's service oriented. It can scale out. It can. Uh, it's a self service. It's uh, having the disaster recovery in place. It's multi tenant. It's elastic, right? So these all are the advantages that cloud brings into the table which you cannot get within your on-premise servers. Now, this is what we have covered already. So this, at the left-hand side, this, if you are having an on-premise server, these all are the things that you are going to maintain by yourself. All You need to bear all the cost. You need to take all the headaches of maintainability and uh, availability, right? In terms of infrastructure. So, what is the difference between infrastructure as a service and what is platform as a service? Any idea? We haven't talked about this IAS and PaaS. So when you, so someone said that a few of you have uh, uh, open that portal.azure.com and uh, step into it and uh, maybe provision some of the application and use it. So what is what is that? Is, is that a um, platform as a service? Is that an IAS? So, okay, I understand that uh, you don't have that pass, not necessary in Avnit. Can you provision a VM through that? You can, right? What you will do after provisioning a VM? What is VM? It's virtual machine. We are responsible for IS, but not for PaaS. Okay. Like our computer, right? It's a like like our computer. VM is like a computer or a server rather, which can host it on a on a cloud. But once you hosted it or hosted the VM on the cloud, suppose you were um, hosted or provisioned an Azure VM. From that point of time, that VM the VM as a server, the maintenance responsibility is on the vendor side, right? But Vendor side in, in terms of cloud vendor side or the cloud provider side. 
now it's it's just a just a machine or a just a uh, server right it does not consist of any application it does not holds any application in it no applications are installed that you need to do suppose you need to use sql server right so there you need to use your own application and that application you are responsible to maintain cloud vendor is not responsible to maintain that application because you are installing that so you are responsible to maintain that but cloud vendor is responsible to maintain the availability of the vm server right so in case of any issues happen to your application you by yourself needs to manage it we can install things according to our convenience right whatever informatica and uh, terra uh, terra maybe you can install terra data or uh, maybe some other applications uh, sql server oracle whatever you would like to install and use it you can do it but it is your responsibility not cloud vendor's responsibility right so that may go down that particular applications can may, may go down so you are compromising on the availability side of that application though uh, the cloud vendor is uh giving you the assurance of the availability of the server that does not makes uh, assured that your applications will up and running uh 24 by 7 because that you need to maintain by yourself right that that's called as ias now coming to pass what is pass azure ad is uh, the security access uh, navneet um, that is the active directory that is the method of um, giving access to your applications yeah platform as a service i know but uh, means my question was uh, what it is about how it is different from uh, is infrastructure as a service web app is an application within um, azure cloud platform as a service so it's mm, application and data has been managed by rest by user rest by azure are you talking about uh, navneet can you come to the voice okay sure yes sir so uh, at, uh, this is the answer for uh, pass or is So in IS application data runnable middleware OS, these five things are managed by the user, and rest is managed by Microsoft. That is security, server, and networking. But in case of right. PaaS application and data is being managed by the user, and rest is managed by Microsoft, which includes runnable O middleware OS, virtualization, security, server, networking. This all is being managed in case of PaaS. But coming not to really, some, I don't agree with your second first. First one was fine for IS. For second one, I don't agree. because applications right that is again managed by microsoft the only thing is the configurations managed by you on on the application side right that how much uh, when you are provisioning an application suppose you are provisioning a sql a sql db or uh, synapse analytics nowadays or an hd insight or databricks whatever while provisioning that particular application you need to configure it as per your usage that how much computation you required how much storage you required blah blah but in terms of availability perspective of managing that server perspective that is up to microsoft or the cloud vendor okay because that particular application has to be available to you and they will probably give you the availability that is 99.99 or it depends upon the application to application it can be up to uh, six nines right so that availability you cannot do anything support the, suppose there are ha some maintenance happening within the data centers right or there are some outage in the data centers so microsoft or the amazon or the google cloud whoever is the cloud vendor will be responsible to to give you that application running uh as per their commitment that is whatever they commit for that particular applications right R data i agree 
data you need to manage that the storage how, how you are storing in which uh, format you are storing how long you will be stored that th this all these features will be managed by you not by the cloud vendor but uh, that is what the advantage is, is there is very minimum area that you need to manage at end of the day apart from your regular development and implementation is that answer your question, uh, Navneet? Yes, sir. Uh, actually, in the document part, it was given application and data being managed by the user and rest by Microsoft. Right. Applications managed by user, it means that you need to configure and provision those application. If you want, you can delete those application. That is what the man managing the applications belongs to you. But the availability of that applications is still resides on the vendor end you got my I point, get the point. Right? yes sir we can yes. proceed ahead okay now coming back to this now you you people already knows what i was talking about so i need not to go through this slide and this is what i uh, i'm looking for that before coming to the slide, you should know that what we are talking about. So this is what is infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and SaaS, that is the software as a service. So even in the PPT, it is given application and data being managed by the uh, user. Even in the PPT, it is given application right, and data. Right, right, right. That's what I'm saying. Application, whenever they are talking about the applications, that is, uh, that is the part that how you will be provisioning, when you will be provisioning, when you will be deleting those kind of uh, features that you need to manage that is not going to be managed by Microsoft or the Amazon or some other vendors, right? But again, I'm telling the availability of those applications has to be come from the cloud vendor only. So if you see the runtime, right? So that comes under that availability part. Even, even the uh, patches that used to come for those applications will happen in backend itself from the cloud vendor itself. You need not to uh, monitor or you need not to do anything for those patches. That will happen uh, behind back, in background while your applications are running. You got my point, right? So suppose you are using the uh, this one um, Android phone. So they keep on updating the OS, right? So what do you do? You allow you to uh, you allow that OS to be updated in certain time. Else, it will happen. Uh, if you set it uh, sometime, it will already uh, update your OS as per the latest version. But Actually, you are not managing or you are not applying those uh, patches to your applications. You're there, Navneet? So it is there. We can move ahead, sir. Okay. So uh, now coming to the data-driven innovations part. So how this happens is we can have the sensor data we can have multiple batch data right and we may have some mobile app, mobile or uh, multiple apps data that may uh, be the source of your applications implementations and uh, that will flow to the uh, cloud environment and then you will be doing uh, storing it you will processing it you will um, uh, try to get uh, some insights out of your data and put it into your uh, reports or uh, you can also use the bot, uh, bot or cognitive services to interact with the end users again. So these are the overall flow. So what is mentioned over here in the information center is the ingestion part. Uh, I'm not sure whether you are habituated with this terminology ingestion. Um, what is ingestion?
एनीवन व्हाट इज द इंजेक्शन सो इंजेक्शन इज कमिंग फ्रॉम द इंजेस्टिंग द डेटा राइट व्हेन आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट इंजेस्टिंग इट्स मे बी द इंसर्टिंग द डेटा इनटू द क्लाउड एनवायरमेंट फ्रॉम uh outside applications so you can use data factory i'm not sure how many are uh, you people are aware about informatica right it's an etl tool uh, extract transform load tool so uh, here the data factory is the elt extract load transform tool which ingests the data from the outside world to, to azure maybe it can store into your data lake or in your data warehouse or in cosmos db and then uh you you uh if it is a streaming data right suppose the data continuously feeding from twitter or from iot devices and those things it it may flow to the event house which which will act as an uh message broker over here so i am just going a little slower here just let me know if you don't understand anything because i am going into the very technical or using very technical terminologies over here so probably you won't be that much habituated with this terminology so you can uh, stop me and ask me the questions okay so once the data is ingested and uh, stored into some of the storages whether it is in data lake or in data warehouse or sql db or in cosmos db that that uh, gives you the second block of big data stores right and once that is there what we need to do is what we need to do is we need to uh, get insight out of those data so it's uh, we can uh, implement machine learning we can do the big data processing using data breaks or hd insight even we can stream the data using the stream analytics and what will be my uh, end consumptions of this is the power bi reports you could use power bi reports for your uh, dashboard and visualization and you can also use the bot uh, cognitive frameworks uh which uh, the ai part which can intelligently interact with the end user and can uh, uh, provide them the uh, answers to their uh, questions and uh, so and the this data can flow to the applications again uh, for further consumptions so this is for the data part so this is the last slide that i am having uh this is the holistic view of the uh, number of applications that uh, uh platform services are having an in azure there are a uh, few uh applications are missing which are uh, newly introduced so this is not very updated one but it will give almost 90% of the components that it is having currently so at the uh, left hand side you can see all the security components whereas media and cdn integration components the someone talks about that web apps right you can see it is an application platform which deals with web apps compute services developer services so these all are having different different roles to implement within a solution which we you can later deep dive to check which particular components uh, can be used for what, what kind of purposes for data purposes we are having a block at top which gives you the sql db data warehouse which is called now azure synapse the document db is now called as cosmos db uh then redis cache storage tables azure search uh and then the intelligent ai part which is the cognitive services broad framework and cortana analytics and iot the streaming data can be handled using hd inside the broker can be used as an iot hub event hub or kafka uh streaming data can be handled using hd inside stream analytics right and can be stored in data catalog or uh, data lake stores and the right hand side gives you the hybrid cloud mechanism with azure ad and those this gives you the access control as well uh, which is known as known as acl and the bottom part is the compute storage and the networking and that very uh down uh below the things those are the data centers on top of which this applications resides on and that is easily accessible to you once uh, in a uh, few click of a button okay so i would uh, like to uh, wind up here uh, just would like to show you even uh, in case you don't know how these data centers look like so this truck is holding a 
uh, enter uh, uh, server containers, which will be put into a particular data center. A data center uh, will have uh, uh, is having uh, usually have uh, multiple uh, server containers like this, and the inside of this server containers looks like this uh, this picture. It consists of multiple servers which used as in a shared basis in different locations, uh, geographical locations. So that's all from my end. Uh, uh, any questions, just let me know as we will. Yeah, so Sumit, I'm coming to that. Uh, why I haven't uh, touched on the programming side is because when I, um, if you look at these applications, right, each applications required a different uh, programming knowledge, okay? So uh, suppose if you are on web app and uh, API side, you, you require the .NET knowledges. If you are on the big data side, you need SpySpark or uh, Scala uh, knowledge. Whereas when, when, whenever you will be on the data, data side, you require a SQL or uh, SQL or NoSQL knowledges for Cosmos DB you require NoSQL knowledge. Whereas for SQL data warehouse and DB, you need SQL knowledges. Uh, so there are multiple scripting, even even when you are in uh, uh, machine learning, right? You probably need to code it in our language, our scripting, right? Uh, so there are quite a few languages involved in it. It's not specific to a certain languages. So I deliberately uh, did not touch upon that point. It's because though you need to learn, a particular, you need to start with learning a particular languages, but don't restrict yourself to that particular language. What do you need to understand the concept, the implementation perspective, how it is needed? Uh, that is more important. And once you, at least if you know one language is thoroughly, then the concept can be used to implement into the other language. And the uh, code, if you Google it, you can get thousands of code, uh, once you Google it, right? So you need not to remember each and every uh, syntax or something that you need to write. The more important part is don't restrict yourself to a specific languages. Maybe you, you will be starting someone, some of you will be starting with uh, .NET. Maybe some of you will be starting with uh, SQL or if you are lucky, you can start with PySpark itself or Python. But I would suggest once you, Walk thoroughly on that particular language. Learn thoroughly on that particular uh, and that particular language. Don't don't restrict yourself. Just try to learn some other language so that your motto will be to move on from one technology to another technology to check how it can be implemented, how it is getting used in the industry, and how you can innovate it by creating some accelerators or something so that. Um, you will you can improve uh, down the line in your career. Azure DevOps is uh, basically for a CI/CD pipeline uh, continuous continuous integration and continuous deployment, which uh, will uh, automate the deployment process from lower environment that is maybe from dev environment to staging and the higher versions. So that is used for that one only. Uh, thank you, sir, for joining in and for highlighting some of the most vital points. And I believe everyone would have learned a lot today. For having such a wonderful interaction, we are very happy to have you on board so that our young minds could have such healthy interactions with you, which would definitely help them in building their concepts when it comes to cloud right. and Azure specifically. Thank you for coming, sir. Yeah, I, I hope so that uh, you people have got some of the information and insight about Azure. Uh, you can connect me in uh, LinkedIn uh, whenever I will get time. I can refer back to you. So uh, all the best for your future endeavors, and uh, hope we will we will all will be connected. Now we have Sukumar, sir, who would say a few words about the event. Can you please unmute yourself, sir? Uh, 
हेलो यस सर सर स्पीक अप सर स्पीक अप हेलो यस सर वी कैन लिसन यू वी कैन लिसन यू हेलो ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ फिनिक्स मेंबर फिनिक्स मेंबर नॉट ओनली द मेंबर द मेंटर फ्रॉम द फैकल्टी we uh, welcome all the uh, member of phoenix for arranging such a beautiful uh, the program uh, the cloud face of the 2k20 and uh, as nowadays now nowadays the uh, the cloud is uh, very much important or uh, cloud computing nowadays a uh, key driving force of uh, for the business and presently in the market three big Uh, public vendors are playing at the such as amazon web services or the microsoft azure google cloud platform they are the major uh, the player in the public uh, domain or the besides this or the so many private organization also the uh, the playing uh, playing in this field and their main aim is to host and maintain the core infrastructure including services and storage and networking on behalf of the customer in a highly scalable environment customers are not only cha are charged very nominal uh, for using this infrastructure and presently the machine learning and ai also the blooming area in this cloud computing area and besides this the hybrid cloud model uh, the focusing on uh, the helping the uh, serve the customer specifically in hybrid and multi cloud the need so based on this so the demand of the this type of the training program i hope everyone will be learn a lot and it will help them to get a uh, good job in the present of the future so my sincere thanks to gnx as well as the phoenix of the member for arranging such training program thank you thank you sir for your thank words you, for your and words. now coming and to the attendees it is it's just a beginning we have many more things in our close at which are ready to be explored and we would love to have you in the upcoming events as well now we'll be dropping a feedback form in the comment section and we would love to hear from you about the various suggestions which we, you could give us so that we would improve in the upcoming events the uh, i guess it is visible to everyone and the form is dropped the form is open now for the next 20 minutes so kindly fill up and give us your valuable suggestions thank you everyone for joining in thank you